Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. So uh, this week, well, like every single week I teach, I, I like to shatter some, some myth. Because there's so many of them to shatter. So, it, you know, it's, like, it's you know, like shooting a fish in a barrel. It's pretty easy. If you can do it. And I think that that's what God has been doing with me for about 30 years. It's just finding a way to shatter myth after myth after myth after myth. There's thousands, tens of thousands of them. So um, we're going to do another one today, as usual. And this one, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you the end of the story before we start. The end of the story is this. If you've got in your mind, like if somebody says, let's pray, and you immediately, a, a verse comes to your mind, something like prayer, or the, I, can't even, I can't even quote it correctly, something about pulling, no, that's from Jacob, pulling down strongholds. Oh, yeah. Casting down. Restoring the gates of heaven. That's a different one. Okay. So, if right. you have a verse that, that's, that's, one that's one of them that comes to your mind like that, um, hopefully I'm going to help you put that in proper perspective. Because it's in the New Testament, right? That means it was written by a Jew, two Jews, and Gentiles who were living a, Gent a Jewish life. So, we got to put it back in that schema in order to understand what in the world it's talking about. Right. You can't pull it out and just quote, quote it or claim it and expect something to happen. It's not. Nothing's going to happen. There's no magic. The Bible is the Bible because it's his book to get us to know him. So if we're reading stuff and we don't know what it's saying, we're not getting to know him. So that's why it's very, very, very important to shatter mythology. It's extremely important. And that's why uh, I think that God is having me do it. So we're going to be in Devarim 21. The Torah portion, start, Torah portion starts in Devarim 21, <clears throat> verse 10. <clears throat> if you have a Bible in front of you, it's so much easier because then if you catch a mistake, you can say, oh, that's a mistake, which I like. And if you see something else that brings you to it, because you're looking, that's cool too. So it's easier to do that. So it says in uh, verse 10, when you go out to battle, wait, I can't start yet. Sorry about that. Here's another myth we have to shatter. It's, it's, it's not so much a myth as it is a trite phrase. Trite phrase, like there's so many trite phrases among believers that they just throw phrases out and expect everybody to know what you're saying and nobody knows what you're saying. Circumcise your heart. Right. What does that mean? Everybody's got a different idea of what it means and I know this because I've been doing this a long time. I'm not saying something that's new to me. I'm saying something that's old to me. So for many, many, many years, about 40 years, in talking with believers, I will say to them, what does it mean to circumcise your heart? And one person will say one thing, one person will say another, but nobody's ever consistent in their answer. Or they'll say that phrase to me, and I'll say, what does that mean? And they'll say something. But it's never from Scripture, never, not one single time. It'll be a trite phrase like, well, be holy, or uh, we need to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he'll lift us up, or something like that. But never anything clear of, how do you circumcise your heart? How? How do you do that? Okay, so that's what we're going to be talking about. So now let's go to the Torah portion. Sorry about that. Devarim 21.10. When you go out to battle. Now in Hebrew it says, kitetse, when you go out, singular. Really? One person's going to go out to battle? Yes, David did. Yeah, but that's, one yeah, but that's not normal. That's an anomaly. One dude going out to fight an army, that's ridiculous. It happened twice. It happened with Samson, it happened with David, but that's an anomaly. But why would God tell all of Israel, all of Israel, you singular, you personally, you personally, when you go out to battle? So obviously... Yes, Israel is one man, and you're absolutely right. So thank you, Chris. But that's not what it means here. 
it's not talking about the one man of Israel. It's talking about one person. It's talking personally to us. And I'm saying this because this is what all the rabbis say. Oh. All the sages say this, and it's personal. It should be kititzul, which is plural like a group. Kititzul, when all, when all y'all go out to battle, that's what it should say, but it doesn't. It says when you, singular, go out to battle. So this is talking about, this is personal for you, just for you. So each one of the many has to do it personally. Yes, each one of the many has to do whatever this is personally. When you personally go out against your enemies and the Lord your God hands them over to you, so you've gone out to war, God handed them to you, did it say you beat them? No, it's implied. No, it's not implied. Did it say, there's nothing implied in the Bible, ever. Everything is, you got to be able to prove it from Scripture. Nothing is implied in the Bible. Everything is there for a reason. So God beat them. Okay, let's, let's read it again. When you go out personally against, in battle against your enemies, and the Lord your God hands them over to you, did it say you beat them? No. no. What did it say? God gave them to you. God gave them to you. And there's the answer. God fights, not us. So whatever this is, whatever this battle is, it's not just going out. Like this is not Joshua going out with the Jews to take the land of Israel. That is not what this is. So is, is that the way we're always to look at things that challenge us that God will let's, let, let's just Let's just stay where we are right okay. now. Try not to go too far ahead. You're going to lose your mind. <laughs> Easily done. Easily done. So let's try to stay focused on where we're at. So, <laughs> so where we're at right now is whatever this is, and I'm not saying what it is yet. Whatever this is, it's God directing it to each one of us personally and that he's going to fight some battle, not us. That's all we saw so far. You got it? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Tracking. And you and and then it says, and you, not God, you take captive his captive. Vishavit Shivyo. It says the word twice. Vishavit and you captive Shivyo, his captive. So that re emphasizes there is. Well, the question is, why does it say it twice? Why does it say Shivit Shivyo? Why doesn't it just say and you and you take Captives would be kach, which would be in Hebrew, vata kachacha, kachacha uh, uh, shavit. You take a captive. Why doesn't it say that? Here's why. It says it twice because of this. And I know you've heard this verse, and it's probably been ruined for you. So <laughs> hopefully we can get it straightened back out. Uh, I can't even remember how it goes. It's it's in Proverbs. We're going to come across it later. It says something like. The wealth of the of the wicked laid up for the righteous. I knew it. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. And people quote that as if it has to do with now. It is not now. It's only for the Jews. And then it's in the kingdom. But that verse is why it says Vishavit Shivyo. Here's why. So God told them when they're when they're going uh, up and they're taking the land of Israel on the east side of the border in the last, we'll say the last 30 some years, they were going up on the east side of the border and they're taking who? Who did they take? They beat two gigantic kings. Who were they? Really? Og. Say it. Very good. Sihon and Og. Right? Do you remember what people they were? Nasty. Nasty. Say it again. Ammonites? Amorites, Amor not Ammonites, Amorites, Amor. 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 Okay. Now the Amorites, not only did they own everything, almost everything on the east side of the Jordan, they owned a third of the land on the west side, just you know, in Israel proper. Right. This was huge, huge, huge uh, kingdom. And God told the Jews, when you go and you conquer all that land on the east side, do not touch Moab. That's your cousin. Abraham's uh, cousin Lot, 
had oh. Moab and Edom. Oh. Uh, not Edom. Moab and and, uh, and uh, the Ammonites. Am Am Ammonites. Ammon. Moab and Ammon. So those were our cousins. He says, don't mess with them. You're not taking any of their land. But we got their land. How do we get their land? God told us not to mess with them. Anybody, anybody know? No? Think back when they're in taking the east side of the Yardin. How did, how did Israel end up getting all that Moabite and Ammonite land. Did King Solomon marry, marry the No, princess? no, that's way later. When, they're, when the Jews are taking the east side of the Jordan. Nobody? Okay, I'll tell you. It says it in Book of Numbers and Deuteronomy. <clears throat> the Amorites, the bad guys, the Amorites went and took all that land from Moab. Mm. They had it. They set up their kingdom in Heshbon. Heshbon of Moab. That was their capital of Ammon. It wasn't even their land. It was Moabite land. And so, who did we take? Right. Sihon and Og. Where were they? Heshbon. Uh, okay. So we got it secondhand. We, we never had to touch. We never had to touch Moab and Ammon's land. But God gave it all to us. How? By having... The Amorites come in, take it all, and then we destroyed the Amorites and took it. So that's why it says here, Guzan, honey. That's why it says, Vashavit Shivyo, two times. Two times. Moab and then Ammon. So then we got it. Does that make sense? Now that's what the rabbis say. You can buy it or not buy it. If you buy it, it'll give you more revelation. It did me, but it's up to you. Oh, here it is. It's in Proverbs 13.22. That's where that verse is. Okay. If somebody wants to turn to it and read it, that would be great. The Shavit Shivyo. You captive captives. No reason to say it twice. It should just say take captives. A good person leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren. And the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. The wealth of the sinner, or the wealth of the wicked is what it says in Hebrew, rasha. The wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. And that's what happened here. So, and you see among the captives that you took. You took the captives, right? Yep. Who did the battle? God. Who did the battle? God. Okay, not us. God did the battle. We get the captives. We take the captives. Now here's where it gets funky. Here's where everything falls apart. <laughs> you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and you are strongly attracted to her. Is she a Jew or Gentile? Gentile. Okay, here comes trouble. Here comes trouble. It's a Gentile woman, and you're very attracted to her, and you would take her as a wife for yourself. What if you're married? It's another wife. It's another wife. What if she's married? Adultery? No. Mm -mm. Doesn't matter. You beat, you won her in war. You now, you know, the war, God did the war. He gave you the, the battle, right? Yep. And you took the captives and you look at her and you're like, ooh, I like that. And she's married to another guy. Yes, that is correct. So, this is, this, is, this is where it gets really sticky. Okay. It gets weird. You see among the caps a beautiful woman. You're strongly attracted to her. You would take her as a wife for yourself. Here's what you do. You bring her into your house. Now, there's no way you're going to see the meaning in this passage. It's not there. It's not even there in any other verses in the Bible. It's only in the Mishnah. And in the words of the sages... Because they go through the Hebrew, they pick it apart, and they say, they relate it to other verses, and they say, see this, see this, see this, this is what it's talking about. And I, I just, we don't have time to do that, so you're going to have to trust me that they did it. Here's what it says. You would take her as a wife for herself, then you shall bring her into your house. Is she a Jew or a Gentile? Gentile. Okay. Take the Gentile woman into your house. She shall shave her head. Does that make her beautiful or ugly? Ugly. Yeah, make her ugly. Does it make her beautiful or ugly? Ugly. 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 Makes her ugly. 
She shall do her nails. Now, what, is, what the rabbi says this means doesn't mean she got her nails did. What it means is she pairs them down to nubs. No weapons. Is that... <laughs> right? It's not about weapons. So she pairs down her nails to nubs. I always thought it was just the opposite. I always thought it was like, you know, like make them beautiful, but it's not. So they can go one or two ways. You can bring them down to nubs or let them grow long and like nasty. So either way, is that pretty or ugly? ugly. Either way, it's ugly. So Shave her head, off take off the nails, ugly, ugly. And remove the clothes of her captivity. Now here's what the rabbis say, that when the Gentiles, when the Gentiles went out to war, that the women would dress up beautifully and they would entice the men. How do we know this? First-hand accounts? Say it again. First-hand accounts? Yeah, but where? How do we know this in the Bible? Torah. Yeah, but what does it say? Where did this happen? Where the women, the Gentile women, dress themselves up and they entice the men? Really? Belam. Belam had all the Moabite women, remember? And they enticed all the men to have sex with them and have sex with their demons, remember? By worshiping with food. There's a call back to that. Worshipping their demons with food. So they're taking off their beautiful clothes. So they've taken off their hair, they've taken off their fingernails, they've taken off their beautiful clothes, and just stay in your house. Now what it says is stay in your house and mourn for their parents. Mm -hmm. So you got this ugly, messed up woman that you at first thought was so hot, and now she's in your house. You can't get rid of her. And she looks like death warmed over. And she's yelling about her family. Oh, my mommy and my daddy. Does that sound like fun? No. no. Like a headache. All right, so this is bad. This is really, really no good. And this was the law. This was the Torah. This was, you want to call it a law or a commandment? Call it a law or a commandment. Either way, that I mean, the established thing. yeah, but think about it as a law. This is a law. You will take that gorgeous woman into your house, make her look like a troll, and let her cry for 30 days out loud. And by the way, the rabbis say that in the mission that says you're supposed to have the woman by the front door hmm. so that you have to go around her to get out. So any way you look at this, this is bad news. This is bad. So let's review what the very first thing is. Why does it say kititse, not kititsul? Because it's personal. When you personally go out to battle, who does the battle? God. God, because God is a strong man of war. God is a man. God is a man. Ish milchama. God is a strong man of war. Ish milchama. God is a man. Yes, literally. And then another verse he says, God is not a man that he should lie. So God is like really confused. And contra and contradictory. So. Yeah, but God is a man of war. But God is a man of war. So what I'm showing to you is if you look at the Bible as laws, you are trapped. You are trapped. You're trapped because it's contradictions everywhere. But if you look at it as pictures, it's simple. Yeah, God's a man. Men are a picture of God. Big deal. God's a man. You see man, you've seen God. You see God, you've seen a man. So <clears throat> he is the man of war that does the battle. After he does the battle, who takes the captives? You. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you. You personally take the captive. Right? Mm -hmm. yes. Remember, this is personal. This is about us. So she starts out ugly, and here's what the rabbis say. Convert. She becomes a convert. Or you send her away with how much money? Nothing. No. You don't remember from last week? Thank you. 200 shekels. You have to give her a ketubah. Two, yeah, 200 zuzim. Thank you. 
200 Zuzim, you've got to give her money because you've humbled her. You're the one who, you're the one who took her in and shaved her hair and <laughs> made her look like a troll. You've got to give her some money. Was that so they'd regret doing it? Yes. She was a yes, and that's what the rabbis say over and over and over. If you want that Gentile woman, she will eventually lead you to idolatry. She will. And not only that, but she will then bear children that are the rebellious child that's in the very next verse. Mm -hmm. Yes? You know, the, I think like the big thing here is if you see among the captives a beautiful woman and are strongly attracted to her, it's like self-control. It's like you're going into battle, focus on the battle instead of, you know. Okay, you're getting, you're getting ahead of the game. Uh -huh. you're, you're, you're dead on. You're right on target, but you're ahead of the game. So, I mean, you can obviously see a problem with the guy who's going out to get the captive, right? Yeah, yes. okay. he's distracted. Uh, yeah, distracted, but overly attracted is better. He gives in to lust. Being deceived by his eyes. Okay. So here's what Rashi says, if you go out to war. The verse here is referring to an optional war, not the war to go take the land. How do we know that? Because God says when you go into the land, are you supposed to take captives? No, no you kill everybody and everything. Right. So this cannot be that. It has to be a different kind of war. Make sense? Yes. That's really the, the, the most important thing about this. Since, since in reference to the obligatory war to conquer the land, it would be appropriate, inappropriate to say, and you take his captives. Because there's already been said to you regarding the seven nations of Canaan. From these peoples, you shall not let a single soul live. Right. So what captive? None. None. So obviously, this is a different kind of war. This is not taking the land. So this is not <laughs> the war of taking the land. This is an optional, private, community-based decision to battle a specific enemy, such as the Six-Day War such as the war in 1948 to take the land of Israel. Yes? How about Purim? War of Purim? The War of Purim. Yes, absolutely true. It's a community-based decision. It's not where God says, go to war. It's where we decide to go to war. The War of Hanukkah? The War of Hanukkah is another example that the sages use. Good. So it, it's obviously something different. It's not the war of taking the land. And I'm sorry about this. I was, I was going to put a picture there. <laughs> sorry about that. That's the next slide, the teaser, or what? <laughs> so the, the war that God says to do is a different war. And then there's this war, the war that we choose. It's personal. It's a choice. So obviously, this is not talking about real war. Can you see that? Can you see that it's not talking about war? It's talking about us personally? Yeah. Now, the very strange thing about this is it starts with ki titze, when you go out. We're not going out, we're going in. Yeah, which is the next week's Torah portion t title. No, but it says that against your enemies, not, it doesn't say when you go out to take the land. No, no, li listen, you, didn't, you missed what I said. We already know it's not to take the land. Right. It's to go out, but it's personal. So it should say, when you go inward, but it doesn't. It says, when you go out. Next week's Torah portion is called, when you go in, right? Mm -hmm. This week is ki what's, what What's next week? When you go in. Yeah, but what is it in Hebrew? Ki when you go in, when you go in. So it's, it's, it sounds weird to me. I would have thought that God would start it when you go in because it's personal and we're going inward. And that's what all, and I mean all, the rabbis say about this. That this is about making war on us. But going out, personally. But going out could be like, you know what, get outside of yourself and look at yourself from outside. Okay, you're thinking pictorially, and I love it. However, we're just trying to make sense of, of the word in Hebrew. I would have thought it'd say go in, because then it's easy. Then it's easy to go, oh, we're going into us, that makes right? More sense. This is harder to see. So my question is, why would God do that? 
Why would God say when you go out instead of when you go into you? So you have to dig a little for the truth. Yes. When Yeshua kept irritating everybody in Israel <laughs> by speaking in metaphors, I think I want to get this on, on the video. This is a little crude, but I want to get it on the video. It's important. It's a little crude, though. In the, one of my favorite movies, As Good As It Gets, with Jack Nicholson, he's just, he's just the most irritating jerk. He's so mean to everybody. And he goes into a diner. It's like a, it's all Jews there that are eating. And he's like the only Gentile. And he can see this obviously Jewish couple next to him, young, handsome, beautiful Jewish couple sitting next to him, and they're talking. And he says, just to irritate them, for no other purpose, people who speak in metaphors can shave my crotch. And I'm like, God, that is crude. But think about what he said. People who speak how? And he's talking about Jews. Right, obviously. Well, you say obviously, but people don't know this, that the Jewish people speak in metaphors only. Because in the Gentile world, you know, things are straight out. They're very linear. We just say things, and you better listen, and if you don't listen, you're going to get punished. That's all. But in Judaism, it's not like that. Everything's a metaphor. Everything's a picture. Everything's a riddle. And you have to dig for it. You have to fight for it. You have to really work at it. And Yeshua made everybody mad because of this. And the disciples said, why can't you just talk? And he says, I only talk to you guys. You guys, I'm, you know, it's given to, for me to talk to. But them, I give everything in metaphors and parables. Everything. Why? Because Isaiah said it. You've got eyes, but you can't see. You've got ears, but you can't hear. You've got to dig. You've got to work for it to get it. And I think that's why he did this. I think that's why God said, say, when you go out. But really, we're not going out. We're going inward. So it's a little confusing unless you look at it as a picture. So I just want you to be thinking about that. It's an inner war. It's not an outer war. It's an inner war. Now, what are we supposed to be doing during Elul? Examining. examining ourselves, repenting, checking ourselves, right? Okay. Right now is when this Torah portion comes. Right now is when we're supposed to be doing this. Is going in and fighting something. Are we supposed to fight or are we supposed to take captives? We take captives. Yeah, we don't fight. He fights. So... This, is, this gets tricky. I really, really had to spend a lot of time thinking about this because my tiny little pea brain couldn't figure it out. But I think I finally got it figured out. Um, I had to untangle it. Because I have heard all my adult life spiritual warfare. Yeah. Spiritual warfare. Right. Put on the whole armor of God. See? You know it by heart. With a picture of a Roman army. Yeah, with a picture of a Roman soldier. Put on the whole armor of God. Well, that's fighting. That's, this isn't talking about fighting. This is talking about, what is this talking about? Thank you. Taking something captive. This is not about fighting. This is real spiritual warfare. We don't fight. God fights. God's a man of war. He doesn't say, you are my warriors. He says, he's the warrior. Now, there's a time when he tells us to go take the land, then we're the warriors. But that's, that's not this. Yes? I think it's also significant that we're reading this now, not at the time when the kings go out to battle. Yes. Very good. We're reading this now during a little, not when the kings go out to war at Sukkot. Very good. We don't go out to war. We take captives. So we're going to go inside for an inner war. Our sages point out that the Hebrew word vayigash, different word, and he approached, is employed by the Torah to describe two things, prayer and battle, spiritual warfare. Isn't that spiritual warfare? Battle, 
prayer. Yes. Prayer, battle, spiritual warfare. Isn't that what spiritual warfare is supposed to be? Yeah. Yes? Sure, I think so. Okay. It's employed by the Torah to describe a person entering into battle as well as one engaging in prayer. Indeed, the use of this word often implies a combination of both of them. I'll, sh uh, I'll show you another example of that in a while. An approach that is both a plea, prayer, and a confrontation, as in the case of Judah. Remember the Torah portion, Vayigash, when Judah approaches Joseph and he says, I don't care what you say, I'm going to defend my brother Benjamin, right? And he says, I'm willing to go to war with you, jo Joseph, over this, the most powerful guy in the world. And he says, I'm willing to fight for my brother Joseph, my little brother Joseph. And that's when everything broke. Benjamin, sorry, thank you. That's when everything broke and got better. That's what vayigash means. It means to approach, not just in prayer, in battle. So how do we go out to battle with ourselves? Because it doesn't say go in, it says go out. But it's ourselves. And here's how we do it. And by the way, this comes from a rabbi who's a woman. This comes from a, a woman rabbi. I loved what she wrote about this. Deuteronomy 10. Jehovah set his affection on your fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them to choose you over all the other peoples as it is this day. So, because he chose you, circumcise your heart. What in God's green name does that mean? How? Circumcise your heart and don't stiffen your neck. Okay, maybe I can do that. But how do I circumcise my heart? Be reborn. See, there's another answer, but that doesn't... Uh -huh. He's talking to Israel, who are real stubborn, half of them, and half of them love, love the Torah. And that's who he's talking to. And he says, circumcise your heart. All right, Deuteronomy 30, at the end of Deuteronomy. Moreover, the Lord your God, the Lord will circumcise your heart. Mm. See, that's easy. This is easy. Oh, God touched me and he circumcised my heart. That's what most people refer to by circumcision of the heart. They don't mean they circumcise their heart. They mean God did it. That's easy. I got born again, like you said. I got born again. Well, God did that. I didn't do that, right? That's not what this says. This tells Israel to circumcise their heart. So the question is, how? And is that word your personally, like individually? What? So when it says your, he's talking to people individually. Yes, not yes. Not well, you, I mean, a person can only have one pee pee toilet type. I mean, everybody has to do it with themselves, women and men. Remember, this is personal. This is a personal fight. And the rabbis say, this is just one rabbi who says this. She's, they say, how do we win the war with ourselves? This is how. Circumcise your heart. Unfortunately, they don't say how, except they all say how. And then I'm still like, okay, okay, so like, tell me the steps of how. He told you, here's how. And that's how this teaching is going to end. I'm going to say, this is how. And you're going to go, okay, so then what do I do? <laughs> wax on, wax off tomorrow. Wax on, wax off. That's what it is. So, circumcise your heart. What's the difference physically between Jewish men and Gentile men? Circumcision. Circumcision. So, let's replace this word with another word. Such okay, as, buddy. such as what? What can we replace this word with? Change. Okay, I'll say. Judaize. Thank you. Judaize. The terrifying word that you're so scared of. Judaize. Think about it. What's the difference between a Jewish man, well, to say anciently, because it's not so much anymore, but anciently, what's the difference between a Jewish man's body and a Gentile man's body? Circumcision, a Jewish man's body. So let's just say Judaize. And if you say that, there's our answer. There's our answer. 
Simple. There's our answer. So, God chose you different from everybody on the planet. Therefore, Judaize your heart. Simple. Right? It makes sense to me that if you make the choice to do it yourself, God will follow it up and do it for you. Or, other, or other way around. Think about this. Eileen, we didn't know she was Jewish. She was raised Gentile. She thought she was a Gentile. For all intents and purposes, she wasn't a Gentile. Then God starts telling her she's a Jew. And he, before she even knew what a Jew was, he went in there with a knife, found somehow her penis, and circumcised it. And turned her into a Jewish heart. Gave her a Jewish heart. Nobody did that. God did that. And then she started doing the work. So it can go that way too. It can go God doing it first and then the, we do the work. Or it can be us doing the work and then God will follow up and clean it up, <laughs> fix it up, add more to it, whatever. Okay. Kind of what I meant was along the lines of you'll seek me and find me. we got to do the seeking first. Yes. If we're totally close to it, God's going to go, okay, I honor Okay, that. you're ahead of the game. Yeah. Yes, back up. So... I do, I do want you to hear this, though. Some of you, God already gave you a Jewish heart, but you ain't Judaizing your heart. And that's not good. No. You have to Judaize, circumcise your heart. God will do it. God's already said he'd do it. But he told us to do it. And this, this is the battle. This is the battle. The internal battle. So I'm going to make it as, as easy as I can. And after a question <laughs> yeah and that's why we're all here because obviously we're Judaizing our hearts because otherwise we wouldn't be here we'd be in the church you are a hundred percent wrong okay. you're here because God did it right. that is no guarantee that you're saying. well you didn't say that you said that's we're right. Judaizing our heart not necessarily well, God, did it. God did it I'd agree with that that's why you're here, because God already circumcised your heart. And, and then he drew you. Yeah, you see the difference? And then God drew you, but now you got to do the work to take it home, baby. Take it all the way. Take it over the finish line. The cycle. Yes. So, I mean, I don't want to talk too much about pee-pee toilets, but <laughs> to circumcise, it goes around and around, and it takes off the foreskin. It has to go around. That's the cycle of the Jewish year. Now, some people, they get their self-circumcised after one cycle. I've actually met people like that. I've only met two in my entire life that that happened to. Most people, it takes year after year after year to really Judaize their heart, which is fine. Everybody's different. But that's how it works. So, how do we go to battle with ourselves? What's the inner war? Like we said, this is che, say, say cheshbon. Cheshbon. Hanefesh. Cheshbon hanefesh. You know, we usually say an examination of the soul, but it's really like if you go to Israel today and you go to go to a restaurant, you say, "Let me have the cheshbon." That means the bill, the accounting. Huh. And that's really literally what it means. It, it's an accounting or a bill of the soul. A bill of the soul or a bill of the life. Like, yeah. like you're, you're, you're adding up what you're worth. Yeah. That's nasty. What you're worth, <laughs> what you're worth or, what you, or what you would owe. Both. Because if you go to Chick-fil-A, you ain't going to pay what you go, you know, what you, what you got to pay if you go to Steak Baron or whatever. You know, everybody's different, and every, everybody's worth a different amount. Everybody's life is worth a different amount. We, you know, some give a lot, some give nothing, just absolutely nothing. They don't even have a soul that can be hurt or a heart that can be broken. And some people give of themselves until they're drained. So, you know, it's both. It's what we owe, but it's also what we're worth. 
the Chafetz Chaim said, this is amazing, we would never appear before a king. And remember, we're in Elul, moving toward what? Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, the day of the king. The day that's called HaMelech, the king. The Chafetz Chaim said about Cheshbon HaNefesh, about Elul. Nobody would ever appear before a king without thinking through precisely what he's going to say. Yet most of us, we go to synagogue, we show up there, and we don't give the Yamim Noraim, the days of awe, consistent and serious thought. And that is absolutely true. What is Yamim Noraim again? Days of awe. The awesome days, days, the ten days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur including Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So it's, um, it's a hard thing to do, to be clear-headed enough to make an accounting or a list or a bill of our soul. But that's what we're supposed to be doing. And by the way, unsaved Jews do this by the millions, but we don't. They put us to shame. They put the body of Messiah to shame. Because unsaved Jews rip themselves open and make an accounting of their soul. So, how unsaved are they? I don't know. Kititse, not kititsul. So it's personal. It's the inner war. Here's what it says in the Talmud. These are very, it's a very short sentence, but they're incredibly powerful words. A man's evil inclination, say yetzer. 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 It means inclination, but it comes from the word to squish into a mold, like to reform, to, to squish it into shape. That's what yetzer means. Threatens every day to overpower him. Every day it's threatening to just overpower. All day, every day. But how often do we fight it? Are we supposed to fight it? Yes. yes. No. The Lord fights. Ah, we take it captive. Somebody paid attention. Ah, We're not supposed to fight it. We're supposed to take it captive. God does the fighting. See, this is where I, I really, really had to think this out. I mean, I got, my brain got tangled up all week because I had fighting, warfare, and then captives, and they were mushed together. Then I got them separated, and everything made sense. You got to separate captive from warfare. We do not fight. We take the captive. God fights. Yes? I think it's important, that going back to what you said about Jews and the body of Messiah, the difference with how Jews storm, storm the soul, okay? Even today. How Jews storm the soul. Even today. Where, You're ahead of the game, honey. Well, can I just say it? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, so what I was going to say was the, the reason is a Jew looks at his sin and, and looks at um, this is what I'm doing now, this is what I need to deal with now. Whereas a believer, and this is among believers, they have the mentality of, oh, I'm saved, it's covered, I don't need to deal with anything, even though the sin is still most, going on. Yes, most believers, most. most believers, and I do say most, mm -hmm. have in their mind and in their heart and on their mouth, some of them, it's under the blood. Mm -hmm. It's under the blood. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do anything. Jews rip themselves open like God said to do to examine themselves, to change. And that's the real work. That's the real walking with God. A man's evil inclination, Yetzer Hara, threatens every day to overpower him. That's a huge statement. Is that outside of us or inside of us? inside. Everybody's got, we've all got our own desires. We've all got our own um, 
No, not demons. Battles. No, Did no, not okay. battles, okay. not demons. We've all got our own desires. We've all got our own attributes and measures of those attributes. It's so easy to just go, oh, I got my own demons, I'm battling. I mean, you're never going to do anything because you're not supposed to battle it anyway, number one. And number two, you're putting the wrong label on it so you don't even know what you're talking about. It's so much easier to say, I am prone to anger. Right. Mm -hmm. I love the way it tastes. I love the way it feels. I love the way my mind works with it. I love what it does to my, to my endorphins and the way I feel physically. And it kills me. It destroys my life. That's much harder to say than, well, I've, you know, I've been battling anger for a long time and, you know, I guess I'll just keep working on it. This is hard. This is harder to do because you've got to really examine and, and acknowledge what do you like? What are your desires? Some people, they, they see a plate of cookies, they, they can't stop at one or two or three. They'll eat the whole plate. I'm not like that. Some people, if, if they could eat bread all day long, that's what they do. They, they walk by a bakery and they lose their mind. Some people, they just got to have porn. They got to have porn in front of them. They've got to. They can't live without it. Everybody's got their own thing, man. And, and, and you got to really analyze carefully what your mida means a, a trait, personality trait, what your, uh, your traits are without judgment, without a bunch of craziness. The devil made me do it. How did the devil get involved in there? So you see, this is all, this is all, okay, this is all cautious, careful, a bill, uh, hold on, I'm going to let you talk in a second, a bill written out, carefully thought out, not the devil made me do it, oh well, I'll just try better by God. All right, what, what clicked for you? Oh, so you, we're taking that ugly, we're, we're taking that beautiful thing that is, to our, uh, and we're dealing with it, and then now we're saying that it's a problem, and then God brings it to us, and then we make it ugly. Yes, you got to make it, we're going to get to there, we're going to get to there. You got to make it ugly. You got to make it ugly. Very good. All right, so here's how Jews did that process. At least one example. Here's a, actually a couple of examples of how Jews did that process of taking your midah, which is not a bad thing. My anger is not a bad thing. It's called kas in Hebrew. Kas is a fantastic thing. You got to have anger. It's just, it's too much. I have too much of a propensity. I go too far. <clears throat> but it's a beautiful thing. I got to make it ugly. I got to be able to see it as ugly. So here's what the Lubavitcher rabbi said. The evil inclination is a master at its craft and will bring all, and this is not the devil. This is you. The evil inclination is in us. This ain't the devil. And that's the difference. It's not a demon. It's not the devil. It's the evil inclination. It's the the way we're bent, the, our propensities inside of us. And all day long, listen, all day long, it will bring proofs to justify its cravings. That's not the devil, that's us. It will even claim that what it wants is natural and healthy. It's a good idea, it's a good thing. Engaging it in debates is futile. So what would that be? Fight. Battle. Traces, right? Traces right. back to the garden. Well, well, hold on. That would be a battle, right? Yeah, fighting against it. Fighting against it is futile. It's absolutely futile. It doesn't work. We cannot fight our Yetzer Hara. You can't. One merely takes away time and energy that he could have used to do Torah <laughs> and mitzvot. And that's the bottom line. 
That's how you Judaize your heart. That's how you circumcise your heart. It's that simple. God says, you circumcise your heart. Not him, you. We have to do it ourselves. But how? Judaize your heart by being very careful and systematic and thoughtful about, you know, how we are. Just do a good assessment of yourself. They're not bad. All of our traits are they're not bad traits. They're just out of balance. They're just out of whack. One person comes from the side of Gevorah, strength, and they're just like you. Like, they open their mouth and, you know, cockroaches flee. <laughs> you know, it's just immediate it's from the side of Gevorah. It's not a bad thing. It's a trait. It's how God made you. Some people, like you, just the opposite, from the side of Chesed, like you and you. From this, oh, all three. <laughs> from the side of chesed. <laughs> from the side of chesed. Mercy and compassion. But you can go too far with that. It's got to be in balance. Um, I'm from the side of Gevra, obviously. Nobody needs that to be said. So that has to be reined in. Now, here's another way that Jews did it. This is one of my, this, is, this, used, this guy used to be my hero. He used to be my hero. I, I can't cry without thinking about him. Rabbi Yosef Yosel, in the 1800s in, in uh, Lithuania, Poland, and Russia, and the Ukraine, all four. And he changed the world. And then he died. This is from one of my favorite books called Novorodok, a movement, a movement that lived in struggle. And this is under the chapter called Storming the Soul. Eileen mentioned Storming the Soul. A person, I mean, this is a guy describing what was going on in this yeshiva with a whole bunch of young Jewish boys. When I say young, I mean like from the age of 7 to 30. And there were hundreds of them. And then he set up another one, and another, and another, and another. By the time he was done, there was more than 200 of these. He set up 200 schools, or yeshivot. Wow. A person who entered the room set aside for Musar. So now we've got to explain what Musar is. What's Musar? Correction. Spanking. Okay, but what is it in our life? It is an introspection of what is there that needs to be done. Corrected. Uh, yes, this is what the church calls spiritual warfare. It's, it's, it's the inner war. That's what Musar is, correction, discipline, teaching, instruction, chastening. That's what it is, but it's doing it to yourself. The person who's in this room was confronted with a remarkable sight. In one corner of the room, a boy stands crying out, how did I exchange the eternal world for this passing world? Oi! I became like an animal and followed my inclination, my yetzer, like a horse or a mule without reason. He's saying this to himself. Why do I live? Is he self-pitying? No! He's making war on himself. He's, he's taking something captive. He's taking something captive. He's taking it, and he's looking at it, and he's questioning it, he's dealing with it, and he is going to take it into himself and look at it, and he's taking it captive. This is spiritual warfare. In another corner, a student rocks back and forth saying over and over again, envy, lust, and honor, honor. Lead a man out of uh, whoop, what happened? Where'd it go? Oh, out of this world. Sorry. Leads a man out of this world. Envy, lust, and at honor lead a man out of this world. By the way, when Yosef Yoso began his journey to really, really get to know God and to change the world, um, he met the guy who was leading Musar the movement in Judaism, called uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik, who was an amazing guy. 
And Rabbi Yozel, he wasn't, he wasn't, he was just a guy who was serving God and he had a big business and he was making money and he had to take care of his mother-in-law, his six children, and then a bunch of other people that had come into his house. So he needed a lot of money and he was running, running, making money. And he was, he saw this guy get off the train and for some reason he was just like drawn to him. And he's running, he's running, always running. And Soloveitchik said, young man, why are you running? He says, because I've got to make money to take care of this and this and this and this and this and this. And he said, he said, you shouldn't be spending your time making money for this world. You should be spending time preparing for death in the other world. In other words, become the person that that world needs, not this world. You're, you're investing too much time in all this junk here. Invest your time in, in, the, in the, the world to come. Changed his whole life. And so he did it. He did it. Just left. Left everything and changed his whole life. Another paces back and forth with a mournful chant. A youngster sits in the corner with his head in his hands and weeps to God. Give me a pure heart to serve you, to serve you in truth. Near pandemonium reigns. An atmosphere of somber reflection, exalted emotion, and spiritual striving fills room. If we saw this, we'd go, oh, that's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. It's stupid. Rav Yosef Yosel did not accept the approach of Kelm. Now, Kelm was another yeshiva from another great, great Jew, rabbi, named Simcha, Simcha Zissel Ziv. I love that guy's name. Simcha Zissel Ziv, great rabbi. And he taught Musar, but the way he taught it was very plodding and logical. And there was no real emotional breakthrough. It was just like a little bit at a time, which there's nothing wrong with that. But Rabbi Yosef Yosel says, no, you got to break through. you got to storm your soul to get a breakthrough. And he, 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 he didn't accept the approach of Kelm that sought to uplift a person through gradual purification of the self in the context of a disciplined daily life and study. He felt this deprived one of the reserves of feeling and emotion that are indispensable in this battle for self-mastery. That's spiritual warfare. 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 The word battle means warfare, right? Mm -hmm. But most believers have dealing with ourself and changing totally separate from spiritual warfare. They're not separate. They're the same thing. Who does the battle? God, God not us. What are we supposed to do? Make it take captive. Yeah, make it the end. Take the captive first and then make it ugly. Take the captive, then make it ugly. He was convinced that the soul must be jolted to be transformed. And by the way, if you think you're too old for this, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. He was convinced that the soul must be jolted to be transformed and to withstand the trials of life. Musar's study must be an awakening of ecstatic longing for the good and an equally powerful distaste for that ugly woman in the house with no hair and no fingernails and no pretty clothes and she's by the door screaming for her mommy and her daddy and grossing you out every day for 30 days for 30 days right an equally powerful distaste for all that is petty and selfish so if you can't see yourself as petty and selfish you've got a bigger problem than you think our sages point out that the Hebrew word vayigash, remember I said to, to approach? Who approached who in the Torah portion vayigash? Judah approached Joseph. No. Judah approached Joseph, right. I forgot for a second. And he approached Joseph to defend who? Benjamin. 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 Vayigash, and he approached, but it also means to pray. It also means to pray. So Matthew 3. Why are we going to Matthew 3? We're going to talk about the violence of prayer. Storming the soul is violent. It's a violent act. And in Judaism, 
You've, I know you've never seen this. You've never seen violent prayer in Judaism, I don't think, unless you've been to a Hasidic synagogue. I've seen it in videos. I've never seen it in person. But none of us have ever seen a violent, somebody be violent in prayer. I've seen videos of it among the Hasidim, the Hasidic Jews. So Matthew chapter 3, John the Immerser, already you're gone. You're already gone. <laughs> you're already gone. You're in the New Testament. Jesus is in, and there's John and he's, you know, looks like a caveman. You're already gone. Unless you're picturing, picturing a rabbi, you're wrong. Because they called John, in John chapter 2, rabbi. Rabbi, they were asked him a question. Why would they call a caveman rabbi? He was a rabbi. John the Immerser, the rabbi, came preaching in the desert of Judah saying, Shuvu. When do we say Shuvu? Repent. Now. Right now. Well, before Rosh Hashanah, from, Yom, from Elul to Yom Kippur. Those 40 days is the days of repentance. Do teshuvah, because the malchut is it, it, it's right there, it's coming. What is Rosh Hashanah called? I said it was called the king. Hamelech. Hamelech, the king. Was this during Elul? This was during Elul, yeah. He's saying, do teshuvah, because the malchut is coming, the king. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the derech of the Lord. Make his, it actually says a, a highway, make his highway straight. At that time, what time? They lul. Yeah. This is during a lul. Jerusalem was going out to him and all of Judah were being immersed by him in the Jordan River. Mm. So they're doing mikvah in preparation for what? Rosh Hashanah. Do you still do that today? This is not like, oh, John the Baptist, let's go in water. <laughs> Why? Because <laughs> there's a guy, and he looks like a caveman, and he's yelling at us. Let's go in water. Why? Jerusalem was going out to him. Everybody was going out to him to be immersed by him. As they confess their sins... You ever seen Jews confess their sins? No. Yes, you have. Al Before Al-Chet. When do Jews confess their sins? During Elul. Oh, yeah. During Slichot. Every morning we say Slichot. Confession. Which is then done at Rosh Hashanah. Which is then done at Yom Kippur as Al-Chet. Al-Chet. Remember Al-Chet? Yeah. Okay, this, is, this starts at Elul. So they're confessing their sins. They're doing, they're doing the, uh, the prayers of penitence. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, by the way, Yeshua was a Pharisee, in case you didn't know. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for mikvah, he said to those ones, produce fruit consistent with teshuvah. The ax is already laid at the root of the trees. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. This is not about hell. What is this about? He's not saying you're going to be thrown in hell. What is he saying? Okay, we'll back up. I think you're thinking of it. We'll back up. In Numbers, when, when God said you go out to battle to take the land and you get a whole bunch of stuff, made out of gold and silver and bronze and cloth and leather and all that sort of thing. What are you supposed to do with the, all the leather stuff? Stuff like that. Burn it? No. I don't remember. Wash it in oh, water. Okay. Put it in mikvah. Oh, okay. And the stuff that can't stand the mikvah, what do you do with it? Put it in fire. You put it in fire. That's what he's saying. Oh, okay. He's saying, look, you wouldn't deal with it with the, with the water? Fine. You'll get fire. We're going to clean you one way or the other. God is going to clean you one way or the other. This isn't, you're going to hell because you didn't listen to the caveman who says, go dip in water. So this is during Elul. Now, why did I bring up Yochanan? Here's why. Here's why I brought up Yochanan. 
What did you, this is what Yeshua talking? Yeshua says, "What did you guys go out to see when you went out to see John? A prophet? Yeah, yeah, he's a prophet. But I tell you, he's more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I'm sending my messer, messenger ahead of you who will prepare your derech before you.' That's what it said about John. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, including Yeshua." There has not arisen anyone greater than John the Immerser. Why would he say that? Including Yeshua, everybody born of women, there's nobody greater than John the Immerser. Yes, ma'am? Um, he's preparing the way. He's preparing the road, like in Isaiah 35. Isaiah 40. No, Isaiah 35. Isaiah 40. Okay, so Isaiah 35 says, <laughs> a, highway, a highway will be there, a roadway, and yeah. it will be called the highway of holiness. Yes. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for the one who walks that way. Yes, but the highway, we're told about it as it being the way of the Lord in Isaiah 40, and that's what's being quoted. Yes, it is in Isaiah 35. And it also says in there, I'm going to turn all of the desert into water. Right. Okay? Yes, absolutely true. However, this is about preparing the way for the Lord to come. That's why John was so great. That's why John was so That's it. Because he prepares the way for the Lord to come. That's all. That's all. He is Elijah. In this passage he says, and if you guys can handle it, John is Elijah. Right. So yes, that is true. Okay, now, now look what he says now, after it's saying that. But the one who is least in the Malchut Shemaim, which isn't here yet, the one who's the smallest in the kingdom, in the Malchut, which isn't here yet, is greater than this guy. Why? Because it came. John prepares for the kingdom to come, yeah? Yes. That's why he's so great. But the one who's in the kingdom is greater than this guy. Because it came. In Matthew 5, Yeshua said the one who teaches and keeps the smallest mitzvah. What's the smallest mitzvah? You don't remember? Thank you. The bird's nest. The bird's nest is called the, the smallest mitzvah. The one who keeps and teaches the smallest mitzvah will be called what? The greatest. The greatest where? In the, in the kingdom. Who teaches the smallest mitzvah will be called greatest in the kingdom. And the one who tells you not to do the smallest of the mitzvot and teaches against the mitzvot will be called what? Least where? In the kingdom. In the kingdom. So they're in the kingdom too. Yeah, but they're, they're chopping fire and getting water. Right. They're, they're slaves. They're the lowest. They're in the kingdom, but they're bad news, baby. They're low. Okay. But, and then he says this. So now that he's set up, you know, this thing about the kingdom and the kingdom's coming and John's so great because he said the kingdom's coming, he prepared for the kingdom to come. <clears throat> and from the days of John the Immerser, the one preparing for the coming of the kingdom, until now, the Malchut Shemaim has been treated how? Violently. violently. This is the violence of prayer. The Malchut Shemaim has suffered violence. And violent men are taking the kingdom. What are they taking? The kingdom. What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to fight? No. No. What are we supposed to do? Take, Take captives. captives. That's what it's talking about here. Through prayer? That, yes, through prayer. That, that people who are like really looking at themselves during Elul, because John came during Elul saying, get ready for the, the kingdom. It's Elul, dudes. Do cheshbon nefesh. And the ones who are doing it, they're getting violent about it, like these yeshiva buckers with Rabbi Yosef Yosel, <laughs> and they're storming their soul, and they're taking captive. They're taking captives. Take it. Take what by the force? Kingdom. The kingdom. 
So, you can believe this or not, but this is what I believe with all my heart. The only way to really feel the kingdom is to take it captive by doing Heshbon, by really examining yourself and changing. That's the only way you're going to really feel the kingdom, is if you change. And I'm saying you, because I've done it with me. And so I'm saying for you, because I've done it, I'm telling you from experience, it works. It works. It worked. It worked. It took a long time, but it worked. Seven years ago, I started completely changing, and it worked. Now I feel the kingdom. I never felt the kingdom before like I do. Never. In all those years that we had Derech Olam, in all those years that we were studying the Torah, I didn't feel the kingdom like I can now because I'm changing. I'm still changing. I'm doing the work. I'm trying. I'm really trying as hard as I can. I don't remember what book I was reading. It might have been... you got to speak clearly. I don't remember what book I was reading, but it was one of the Jewish ones. It might have been the way of God that suggested that you take time every evening to do Heshbon HaNefesh. It said you take time every evening to do Heshbon HaNefesh. Evaluate your day. And your yeah, life. I can't tell you what book that was. I Did it say that in the, in the Garden of... Uh, it might have been that book. The Garden of... Emunah, might that Garden of, I, I think it book. did. In the book, The Garden of Emunah, I, b- I believe it says that, that you should do Heshbon. I don't do that. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, I cannot handle doing Heshbon HaNefesh every day. I can't. I just can't handle it. I can handle about seven times a year. That's what I can handle. <laughs> Everybody's different, but that's what honest. I can handle. <laughs> so, you know, do what you can do. Just little bites. But I'm telling you, this is the violence that it's referring to. It's dealing with yourself. The Yetzer Hara will kill you. It'll kill us. Its desire is to kill us. It's not the devil. It's not demons. It's the Yetzer Hara. It's us. All right, you want to see some more violent prayer? I told you I'd give you another example. Here's another example of violence in prayer. Vayigash means to approach prayer and approach in violence. Genesis 32, when Jacob was left alone, a man or an angel or God ish ish, (laughs) wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man or God or the angel saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was dislocated. What a cruel way to win a fight. He had to, like, injure him just to get him to stop being so violent in prayer. Right. He touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then he, I don't know who the he is here, he said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. I don't know who that is. And he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I don't know who that is. I don't know if it's Jacob saying, let me go. Or if it's God saying, let me go. I don't know. I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. I don't know which one is saying that. And I think it works both ways. Really. The rabbis say? No, they don't know either. Uh-huh. But they say one says this and one says that. Right. So I think it works beautifully both ways. Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. This is violent. So he said to him, okay, what's your name? (laughs) And he just stops him in his tracks. Thief. Jerk. That's my name. You want to know my name? My name is, I'm going to come up from behind and grab you. That's my name. And he says, not anymore. You're not Yaakov, heel catcher, heel grabber. Now, this is, it's hard to translate, so I've got all the translation here. Mm-hmm. I've got all of it. You can take your pick. So he said, your name is no longer Yaakov, but Yisrael, for you have been a leader, prince, or minister. That's a sar, Yisrael, Yisrael. You've been a leader, a prince, or a minister, or it could be you fought, that's Sarah, or it could be you've been upright, Yashar, Yasharel. And nobody knows which one or two or three it is. 
It could be all three. All three work beautifully. But whatever it is, this is the bottom line. <laughs> you beat God. You didn't just beat men, you, bought, you beat God. Think about that. You wrestled with men and with God and you won. You didn't lose, you won. Now, the reason this is so important is, is, is because, in my opinion, and, and you know, I may be way off base with this. I, I want to see what you guys think. In my opinion, the only way to make God happy with us is for us to change us. That's the only thing I've ever seen. I mean, like, worshiping makes him happy. You know, when we, when we worship, it makes him happy. He digs it. He likes it. It makes him happy. But when, what really turns him on in my opinion, is when we wrestle with us yeah. and we change us. I would agree. And we become different. We become a, bit, become a different person. I think that really turns him on. What do you guys think? That's my opinion. Yeah. You think so? Yeah. We make the effort. We make an effort, right. We make an effort. That's it? Yeah. I thought I'd get more. Uh, Being new creation in God. Yeah, I thought I'd get more feedback on that. Okay. Like, <clears throat> like when you were teaching us about uh, Caleb, you're saying that that his name even means that the one who overcomes his own iniquity to him, I'll give the uh, the, the Torah keeper. To him, I'll give what? The Torah keeper. That is way too deep to follow. You said it. Yeah, but I said it after saying about 8,912 words. You can't just, <laughs> you can't just give us the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> Go ahead. I agree because um, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's the same. He wants us to storm our soul so that we can go back to that unity we had with him in the garden where we are once again, you know, just focusing on him prior to, to the fall. To the fall. Yeah, he wants us to go back to the first date we had with him. When we were, when he was dating us and we were all googly eyed. And that's why that's why in Song of Solomon the they don't come together until, until the, end. In the garden. Right, they don't come together until they're in the garden. That's yeah. correct. Um, remember we started with the rabbis were asked, how do we change? How do we take captive? And what was the answer? Judaize. Thank you. Judaize your heart. <clears throat> Judaize your heart, circumcise, which means a Jew, Judaize your heart. God may have circumcised your heart, but that doesn't mean it stayed the way it should be. You, you have to circumcise your heart. You have to Judaize your heart. You got to keep cutting. I mean, it sounds ridiculous. Why do I, if I'm circumcised. Why do I have to be recircumcised again and again and again and again? It sounds ridiculous, but it's true. It didn't take. <laughs> yeah, right. So, you know, the vayigash to approach means to pray and to what? To what? To vayigash means he approach. That means to pray. It also means what? No. Oh my goodness. Thank you, honey. To confront. To oh, listen. <laughs> Warfare and prayer. Violence. They're both violent. Because vayigash means to approach in, in war and approach in prayer, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is another example of that, and we know that from Hoshea chapter 12, talking about Jacob wrestling with whoever he wrestled with. In the womb, he took his brother by the... He, even before he came out of the womb, he was violent. He was already trying to take <laughs> Judaism. In the womb, he took his brother by the heel... And in, and in his mature strength, he fought with God. Yes, he wrestled with the angel, and he won. He wept and implored his favor. What does that mean, he wept and implored his favor? That's prayer, isn't it? 
Because it's talking about God. He wrestled with God. He thought with God. He prayed. He asked for favor. Isn't that prayer? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. If you disagree, say no. It's all right. Everybody agrees? Yes. Okay. So this is absolute vayigash to approach in prayer and approach in violence. You need to be violent in prayer. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean all those verses that come to your head in the New Testament. It doesn't. We're reading them wrong. We're reading them wrong. Remember, there's two battles. There's one when we go out to take the land. That's like praying for the president, praying for the city, praying for your friends, praying for physical stuff for people. That's fine. We need to do that. That's not this. This is not that battle. This is a battle that's inside each person individually. And I would tell you, and I truly believe, that some of those verses in the New Testament apply to this. So let's... let's test ourselves and see if it makes sense. So we're going to look at spiritual warfare inside and spiritual warfare outside. So let's go back to our passage. When you go out to battle against your enemies and you take captive his captives and you see among the captives a beautiful woman and would take her as a wife, you bring her into your home she shaves her head, she does her nails, she takes off the clothes of her captivity and stays in your house as a convert. In other words, eventually you Judaize her. So, does this passage in 1 Corinthians apply? For though we walk in the flesh, we don't wage battle according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but powerful from heaven for pulling down fortresses, strongholds, which are not what you probably think it is. <laughs> this is Hellenism. These are thoughts. This is not about demons that are over whatever. This is about Hellenism. We are destroy, and we know it's about that because he says it. We're destroying arguments. Arguments and all arrogance raised against the da'at Elohim, the knowledge of God. Clearly Hellenism. Clearly Hellenism. Arrogance and arguments against Judaism. Okay, so before we go any farther, is that inward or outward? Inward. Is that other people or is that fighting us? Us. us. Those are our own worst enemy. Okay, but just about the arguments and the arrogance and fighting yeah. against Judaism. Inside or outside? Internally. I'd say both. Because every time you talk to a Christian, you know what you're going to come against. Yeah. What are you going to come up against? Well, it's out there, but Hellenism. Yeah. If you let it in there, it's in there. Yes, but when we talk to others and it's we destroy there. the arguments of Hellenism, is that out or in? That's out. That's out. So it, we're, it's, this is both. This is outward and inward. And... And in addition to that, mm -hmm. we are taking every thought, look what word it uses, Definitely a captive. Mm -hmm. That is a direct quote of this passage in Deuteronomy. We take every what? Captive? Every thought. thought. So let's think of the passage that way. Think of it as a thought. Amida, anger, arrogance. Hatred, bitterness, jealousy, giving, stinginess. What are some other attributes? Greed. He said Greed. Stingy. What else? Yeah, stinginess. What else? Lust. Lust. Okay. Think of it that way. Think of them as thoughts. When you go out to battle, which is going in against your enemy, Who's the enemy? Mm -hmm. Yet, yet, sir, hara. Say it. Yet, sir, hara. We're gonna come back to it, so don't worry. 
when you go out to battle against your Yetzer Hara, your Yetzer Hara, and you take captive the thought. That's 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 10. Thank you very much, Doug. Not 1 Corinthians 10, 2 Corinthians 10. And you take captive that thought, that attribute, that thing about yourself. Then what do you do to it? What do you do to it? After you bring it home, what do you do with it? Make it ugly. Make it ugly. You got to look at it. You cannot be the queen of denial, Cleopatra. You can't be in denial. You got to really look at it and take stock of it and do cheshbon hanefesh. You got to really take it into your home and think about it. I keep saying you, but you understand I mean we, right? That's just how I talk. I shouldn't do that, but I do, and I've always done it. But I, I just heard myself. Mm-hmm. So we are, we are taking every thought captive to the submission of Messiah. So that's obviously inward, yes? Yes. Okay. So that one does definitely apply. Would you agree? Yes. Would you agree? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. Something? And, and if we... In, in reference to what you're talking about, Hellenism, if you don't battle inward, that Hellenism within each and every Okay. Purpose, okay. Yeah. Well, yes, that's the inward part of but this. But if you don't battle the inward, you know, um, Hellenism, when it comes time to to dealing with people and pertaining to Hellenism. You get sucked in. Yes. You get sucked in so, very easily. So you this, can't battle it this you first one, this first one, that's why I say outward and inward. Mm-hmm. You have to fight it in yourself first. Hellenism. Which is what it's referring to. Destroying arguments against Judaism and arrogance against Judaism. That's Hellenism. But you gotta do that with yourself first. Because then when it comes time, comes time to talking to somebody else, you're, you're just, you're not even in the fight. You're not, you don't know what you're doing. You're, you're totally ineffective. You're level ground. Huh? You're level ground because you've got it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so that one applies. All right, how about this one, Ephesians 6 that you have quoted. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the... Armor of God. Do you think that applies? So that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Do you think that sta- that that applies? Okay, let me ask you the simple question again. Who is the Ish Milchama? God. Who's the man of war? God. God. God, not us. So, does this apply to our passage? No. No. This where where's taking captives here? Where's the captive to be taken? It's not there. It's not there. This does not apply to this passage about taking captives that I can tell. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see it. So that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and powers and world forces. Is that inside of us? Is that stuff inside of us? Come on, answer me, please. No, this is outward. This is praying against world forces that are there and demons that are there and angels that are there and and all that sort of spiritual stuff. But that's not the high-level prayer. This is a very, very low-level prayer. Well, it's passive. It's telling you to stand. You're not taking anything. Thank you. Trying to survive. Thank you. It's passive. This is a very low level prayer. It's just, I'm not afraid of you. Standing your ground. Standing your ground. Which, you know, that's a good thing. But come on. <laughs> How does that compare to this? Right. Taking your own thoughts and attributes and feelings captive so you change yourself. I mean, that, that's an amazing high-level thing to do. Taught to us by Jews who don't know Yeshua. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. 
I want them to know Yeshua, but it's another matter. But against the rulers, against the powers, against world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavens, this is all outward. Take up the full armor of God so you'll be able to resist. Resist. This is passive. Yes. On the evil day, having done everything to stand firm, stand firm. All right. Good. But it doesn't apply. All right, but how, how about this one? Genesis 22. By myself I have sworn. This is at the Akedah, after God told Avraham to bind Isaac, and he binds Isaac, and he's going to kill him. By myself I have sworn, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, even though he's got Ishmael, indeed I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. Did you ever see that before? Mm -hmm. That's spiritual warfare. This, your seed, the Jews, will possess, take mm -hmm. the gates of their enemies. That does, don't picture the big swinging doors. Gates are the entryway into the city. It's a big room like this size where all the judgments are made. It's like the elders of the city. It's like city hall. Let's call it city hall. Your seed, the Jewish people, will possess city hall of all their enemies. Is that inside or outside? Outside or outside. What do you think? What do you think? Inside or outside? It's outside. You think it's outside? What do you think? You're not going to say anything? I'm holding. What do you think? I think it's inside. What do you think, Gloria? What do you think? Is it inside or outside? In. Think it's in? What do you think, Eileen? I think it's in. Okay, this is outside. Oops. It's, it's just like this. It's the same thing as this. Against rulers, against powers, against world forces of this. You know, it's all the powers of Hellenism and, and paganism and all that stuff, all the demons and all that. Jews will take that. Not Christians. Jews. This promise is to the seed of Abraham, the Jewish people. You ever seen Jews do spiritual warfare? I'm not talking about Messianic Jews. You ever seen Jews do spiritual warfare? They do this. You don't think they do, but they do. Because this is outside. So, does it apply, you think? Does it apply? No. Take captive yourself. Does this apply? Yes. No, this is outward. This is outward. It's not inward. How do we know this? Because it's the Jews taking from the enemy. That's taking the land. You know, like God said, Jews, go in and take the land from your enemies, right? Yes. And possess their cities and their gates and all that jazz. So this is the other war. This is not the personal inside war. This is outward. Got it? Does that make sense? Yeah. Remember, this was said to Abraham way before he gave him the land. So this is also about them taking the land. Taking all those demonic stuff out of Israel. All right. So what we want to do is turn the spiritual warfare inward, not outward. You... Doing it outward is fine, but you know how to do that. It's a low-level way to pray. I, I think you think it's not, but it is. It's so much, so much higher and more delicious to God to see one of his kids turning on themselves and writing down all their attributes and taking stock of themselves and saying, God, I'm going to change this. Thank you. Thank you, I'm going to circumcise my, I'm going to Judaize my own heart. That really turns God on. So let's read it as a picture. Let's see if you can follow it. When you, singular, kitetse, do you remember how you say it? Y'all, when y'all go out to battle, you remember Tetsu. how to say it? Tet, say it again. Tetsut. Tetsut? You're yeah. close. Tetsul. You're very close. 
Oh, there is a double O. There is double O. Titsul. Titsul. So he doesn't say Titsul, he says you singular. Kitetse. When you go out to battle against your Yetzer Hara, when you go to battle against your Yetzer Hara, and you take and you take your evil thoughts and motives. Yetzer means motive. Your evil thoughts and your motives captive. And you see among those evil thoughts and motives an idea, a feeling, a thought, an act that you think is beautiful, like lust or anger or pride or greed, money, getting money or jealousy or whatever. And you think it's beautiful. And you want to marry yourself to it. You shall bring that evil thought or motive into your life and your body. That's what a house is. Like it says in 1 Corinthians that we're waiting for the resurrection and we want to get rid of this tent, this ohel, uh, or sukkah, you know, little tabernacle, and we want to exchange it for what? No, this body. We want to exchange it for what? A temple? No, not a temple. A house. It says you're going to get a new house in heaven, in, in the kingdom, right? We want to exchange this temporary house for a permanent house. A house is a picture of our body and our, and our life, okay? So that's why I translated it. And you would marry yourself to it, and you bring that evil thought or motive into your life and body. Now that sounds stupid, doesn't it? Why do you want to bring it in? Don't you want to get rid of it? Say, say that louder. You got to look at it first. So exactly, exactly. Then this is Heshbon Hanefesh. Unless you really bring it into you and examine it in you, you're not going to get rid of it. It's not going to be ugly to you. You're going to keep going. La 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 la. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't see no chick. Ah no 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 no. But if you really take it, embrace it. Take it in your house, examine it, and start shaving it, taking its fingernails off, take its beautiful clothes off. She, she, she shall change to look ugly to you. You remove the clothing of her Gentile ways. Listen to that again. You remove the clothing of her Gentile ways. This is what all the rabbis say that verse means and remain in your life and body until she's a convert. In other words, Judaize. That makes sense so far? Yes. You get the process? Yes. So you should be left with how? Are you left with how do we do it? Except for doing Heshbon HaNefesh? I thought that's what we're talking about. Well, we got Heshbon HaNefesh, but how do you, how do you take it captive? Before you change it, how do you take it captive? First you gotta see it. You own it. You gotta see it. You gotta see it first. Right? You gotta see it first. Mm -hmm. You gotta circumcise your heart. Yeah, but how? Take it. Judaism. Right. By going Judaism. through the cycle. Right, by doing going through the cycle of Judaism. So basically that's the answer. It's kinda like a non answer. And it's the thing I say every week that I get yelled at for. All you do is tell us to do Judaism. That's what I get yelled at for. That's where all the answers are. <laughs> That's where all the answers are, right? All right, so, so let's look at this again, First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we don't wage battle according to the flesh, because our weapons of our warfare, they're not of the flesh, but they're for the pulling down of fortresses, strongholds, castles, Hellenism. We're destroying arguments and all that arrogance raised up against the Da'at et Adonai, the knowledge of God that's found in Judaism. That's outward and inward. Mm -hmm. And we are taking every thought. I don't really like the word thought because of the way we think about thought. I don't like it. I like motive better. I like yetzer. I like intention much, much better than thought. 
Although everything starts in the brain, everything starts in our thoughts. Yeah. Taking every thought captive to the submission of Messiah to Judaize the thoughts. Now think about this. How are you going to Judaize your thoughts? There's only one way. Studying Judaism. Right? The only way to, you got to you got to know what to replace it with. Renewing your mind. You got to know what to replace it with, yeah? Yeah. So, you take those filthy Gentile, what am I saying filthy? Those gorgeous, beautiful, sparkly Gentile clothes off of her, make her look really ugly, and then give her different clothes. Jewish clothes. Garbage out, garbage in. Yes. So, so, the physical circumcision is with a knife. The spiritual circumcision is with the word which is a sword yes so so you're doing the sword you're taking the sword the word and you're and you're looking at your sin and you're circumcising it with the sword yes that is exactly 100 percent right problem with that let me say it i'm you know just so i can tie it together and then tell you what's wrong with it circumcision is done with a with a knife Extremely sharp knife. I hope so. Not <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that a f- that flint can be churted? Oh, I can't remember what the word is. But the way they knock the chipping. The, chipping. Mm, there's, a, there's another word for it. When they Making. chip, when they chip the chips off of the obsidian or the flint, an exacto blade is so sharp it can come, come down to two microns. Right. Two microns, flint can come down to one. And that's what Abraham used. Yeah. So um, it's done with an extremely sharp knife, but spiritual circumcision is done with the sharp, sharp, sharp sword of the spirit, which is the Torah. But the problem with that phrase is you say that to believers, circumcise yourself with the word of God. Yes, yes, Christ, it was going to, and it all falls apart. Because they think of that as the words of Christ in red. And then you're back to the same problem of Hellenism. So you've got to be really, really careful to picture in your mind the sword of the Spirit is the Torah. It's only the Torah. So we're back to the beginning. Jehovah set his affection on your fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, chose you over all the other peoples as it is this day. Because he did that, circumcise, Judaize, purify your heart, and don't stiffen your neck anymore. In 1 Chronicles 28, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, because it has the word thought and yetzer together. As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart, lev shalem, and a chafetz, a nefesh chafetz, a willing soul. For the Lord, ser- the Lord searches, the Lord searches all hearts. So shouldn't we? That's why we're supposed to do Heshbon HaNetesh. Because he does it. So we should do that. He does it, so we should do it. Makes him happy for us to be like him. He searches all hearts and understands every yetzer of the, th- of the thoughts. So he puts yetzer and thoughts together. So when, you, when it says in the New Testament... Take every thought captive. I've heard that a billion times, but I've never heard anybody say it where they really knew what they were saying. It's not the thought. It's the yetzer of the thought. It's the yetzer hara. It's the yetzer hara. He understands every yetzer of the thoughts, and so we should do, at least some of them. Maybe not all of them, but some of them. So here's, what, here's the takeaway. Here's the takeaway from the teaching. Those of you who are on the video, like... Oh, I still can't do it. I still can't do it. Like, subscribe, and...
comment below. What is, what is it? Is that, is that all there is? Is that yeah, all there the is? It's a little bell so you get notifications. <laughs> so here's the takeaway. Search your own heart to understand the yetzer of your own thoughts. Understand the yetzer. I'm going to say this again. Yetzer means to squish into shape, to reform, to mold. And all day long, that thing is trying to kill us. Remember? That says that in the Talmud, all day long, every day, your yetzer wants to kill you and is trying to find ways to destroy you. So, all day long, you gotta, you got to search your heart to understand the yetzer of your thoughts. Oh, I didn't even say this. If you try... Okay, let me, let, me, let me say it this way. I'm going to use this verse. Pastor, you said about this, this one, that it's static, right? It's passive, right? Yes. After you do everything, you put on all the stuff, stand. It's passive, yes? Yes. In the battle to go take the land, we are supposed to go out and take the land, right? 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 So we go out. out, we go to them, we take the battle to them, we destroy them. Yes? No. That's not this battle. No. What is this battle? God, God takes, the takes it. God does the fight. Right? right. What do we do? Passive. Take. We, take captives. we take the captives after he does the fight. If you try to take on the Yetzer Hara, you lose. You will lose. Remember, that's the first thing that the Lubavitcher rabbi said. He said, if, you, if trying to reason with it or argue with it is absolute nonsense. All it does is take time away from what? Studying and mitzvot. Studying mitzvot, doing Judaism. What you should be doing. What you should be doing. That's all it does. It take, it's waste your time to argue with the Yetzer Hara. So do not battle the Yetzer Hara on its territory. You do it on your territory. Mm -hmm. You take control. You look at your attributes. You s Listen, I, I take control of my own lusts and desires. Nobody's going to tell me what to eat and where to go and who to lust after and what to look at. Nobody's going to tell me that. I'm going to tell me that. And in doing that, I control that attribute. Nobody's going to tell me when to get mad. I am going to control that. So if you take the battle to the Yetzir Hara and you try to do it on his territory, you're going, to win, you're going to lose. He wants to kill you. So don't fight on that territory that you own. You already own it. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The stuff that you own, you went out and got it. That's not this. That's not this. This battle, this battle, you just take captive. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Don't even mess with the Yetzer Hara. Don't do it on your territory. You won that territory, fair and square. If you're going to go fight the Yetzer Hara, you're going to go out to the battle and fight like taking the land. That is not this. That is not this. So, do not fight on your territory that you already own. In other words, uh, uh, advances you've made in your personality, things that you've learned in the Torah, stuff that, wisdom that you've gotten. Don't, don't even mess with the Yetzer Hara with that. Just do more. Do more Judaism. That's all. Does that make sense? Because if you do, you're going to lose. You're going to lose that fight 100% of the time. So all you got to do is search your own heart. Only Torah and mitzvot will allow us to beat the Yetzer Hara, and God will fight. Done. That's it. That's the whole teaching right there. Do Judaism. <laughs> Circumcise your heart. Judaize your heart. That's the whole teaching. And Davia is probably thinking, oh my God, you could have said that in 10 minutes. Right. Which I could have. Yes. 
In circumcision, you have the law. You got to speak up for in the. In circumcision, in the physical circumcision, you have the law. In the spiritual. You have a moel. Moel. Okay. Anyway, you, you. So, in the spiritual, we're supposed to be doing this, but in the spiritual, the need for a well trained circumciser. Would be some would be the rabbi. Because not they're just the rabbi. A well trained moral is not just the rabbi. Because remember you have to have a bait din. Mm -hmm. Who's a bait din made out of? One guy? No, no you gotta have others. Ten? No. A bait no. din only has to have three oh. minimum. But you gotta have others that are wise also. That's why one voice ain't gonna cut it. You gotta have more than one voice to do this, to do Judaism. So, I would strongly encourage you to try to find the time to do Cheshbon HaNefesh literally writing stuff. I very rarely do it, but I've done it. So, I would strongly encourage you to this Elul, literally, write your attributes. Write how you feel about them. Write how you think about them. Write, are they good? Are they bad? Are they too much? Are they too little? Where are you falling short? Take stock of yourself. Where are you... I love this phrase from Rabbi Anava. Where are you holding? I love that phrase. Where are you holding? That means where are you right now? Where are you at? Where are you at? And, and really take stock of it. And write a bill. Like how much are you worth? How much is your life worth? I don't mean like, you know, it's worth this amount of money. I mean it's just worth, it's worth this amount for the kingdom. Like, are you doing anything for the kingdom? Are you getting ready for the kingdom? Or are you just going in circles, repeating the same thing over and over and over again? What, I am not even going to go into that, it's too deep. But, you know, you need to take stock of yourself of how, how good you're doing for and toward the kingdom. Because that's the, that's, that's the bottom line. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are Ish Milchama. You are the man of war. You are really, really uh, skilled Ish Milchama, man of war. And, and, and I ask that you would help us to take captive our Yetzer Hara in some area. I'm going to say three areas, this Elul. I ask that three areas of our of our um, yetzer hara, of our attributes, of our motives, of our, our midot, our attributes would be examined and captured and changed during this Elul. In the name of Yeshua, I thank you so much for the Torah that is the word of God, that is the, the, the slicing sharp sword that does all the work. And I ask that your Ruach HaKodesh would kind of uh, braid together with that sword to direct us and show us how each one of us, of us individually can go inside and do warfare so that we can win. I don't want to just do warfare. I want to win. And I ask that you'd show us how to win, how to win those captives in the name of Yeshua. Amen.